Hello again. <laughs> I bet you're getting tired of seeing me, aren't you? All this reading. Welcome to another live read. And today we'll be reading another short story from the world's greatest short stories. And it's something a bit different today. It's by an author I've never heard of and I can't find anything about it online. So it's sort of a completely blind read. We can infer from the title which is how old Timothy died with a song, that there's some singing and some dying. But beyond that, I can't imagine what it's about. Yeah, apart from someone dying to a song, perhaps. But we'll find out shortly. It's only a short story, which is why I'm reading it. Normally, I wouldn't do a live on Wednesday evening. If you guys um, subscribe to the channel, which you all should definitely do, you'll know that I don't often do a reading on Wednesday evening. I've been at a karate, shout out to Shei Shin Karate Club. Maybe I'll share it with the senseis there, they'll be happy about that. And so it's quite late for me, but again, a very short story. I'm going to read it and I'm blabbering on. And as always, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends and there's ways to support in the channel. And as always, Audrey C has been very generous supporting the channel big style so thanks Audrey and yeah let's get into this short story again going in blind let's see what it's about how old Timothy died with a song by Rainer Maria Rilke Germany 1900 so at the turn of the century what a real joy it is to tell stories to a paralyzed person healthy people are so unreliable they look at things now from one viewpoint, now from another. And after you've been walking with them for an hour and they've always been to the right of you, they sometimes answer you from the left all of a sudden, merely because it occurs to them that it's more polite and shows better breeding. With a paralysed man, one need have no fear of that. His immobility makes him resemble inanimate objects with which he actually has manual, many cordial relationships. It makes him, so to speak, an object far superior to all the rest, an object that not only, lis that not only listens with its taciturnity, but also with its very few quiet phrases and with its gentle, respectful feelings. I like best of all to tell stories to my friend, Ewald, and I was very happy when he called me from his daily window. I must ask you something. I walked over to him quickly and said hello. What is the source of the story you told me recently? He asked. Did it come from a book? Yes, I replied sadly. The scholars have buried it in one ever since. The, scho the scholars have buried it in one ever since it died, which isn't very long ago. A hundred years ago it was still alive and certainly quite carefree on many lips, but the words that people now use, these heavy words that are hard to sing, were hostile to it and stole one mouth after another from it, so that finally it lived on, but very withdrawn and impoverished, only on a few dry lips, as if on a poor widow's farm. There it also died without leaving any descendants, and as I mentioned was buried with all honours in a book where others of its lineage already lay. And was it very old when it died? my friend asked, picking up a metaphor picking up my metaphor. Four or five hundred years old, I reported truthfully. Several of its relatives have attained an immeasurably greater age. What, without ever reposing in a book? Ewald asked in surprise. I explained. As far as I know, they were, they were journeying from mouth to mouth the whole time. And they never slept. Oh yes, arising from the lips of the singer, they surely remained occasionally in someone's heart, where it was warm and dark. Then were the people so tranquil that songs could sleep in their hearts? Ewald seemed quite incredulous to me. It must have been that way. It's claimed that they spoke less, performed slowly accelerating dances that had a cradling motion, and above all didn't laugh loudly the way you can often hear people do today, despite our universally loftier social graces. Ewald prepared himself to ask another question, but he repressed it and said with a smile, I keep on asking things, but perhaps you have a story in mind. He looked at me expectantly. Cheers. <laughs> A 
A story? I don't know. I merely wanted to say those songs were the heirlooms in certain families. That inherited property had been received and handed down again, not quite as good as new, showing the traces of daily use, but nevertheless undamaged, just as an old Bible, let's say, goes from forefather to grandchild. The man without inheritance differed from his siblings who had received their rightful due in that he couldn't sing, or else at least he knew only a small part of his father's and grandfather's songs, and, losing the rest of the songs, he lost that large segment of experience which all those Billany and Zasgi mean to the people. And so, for example, Yegor Timofevi <coughs> excuse me, Yegor Timofeyevich had married a young, beautiful woman against the wishes of his father, old Timofey, and had moved with her to Kiev, the holy city, in which the tombs of the great martyrs of the Holy Orthodox Church have gathered. His father Timofey, who was reputed to be the most knowledgeable singer in a radius of ten days' journey, cursed his son and told his neighbours that he was often convinced that he had never had one. All the same, he grew mute in his grief and sorrow, and he rejected all the young men who crowded into his hut in order to fall heir to the many songs that were shut away in the old man, as in a dust-covered violin. Father, little father of ours, just give us one song or another. You see, we'll take it to the village, and you'll hear it from every courtyard as soon as evening comes and the cattle have become quiet in their stables. The old man, who constantly sat on the heated platform, shook his head all day long. His hearing was no longer good, and since he didn't know whether one of the lads, who were now forever listening around his house, had just made another request, he would signal no, no, no with his trembling white head until he fell asleep, and even kept doing it for a while in his sleep. He would gladly have done what the lads wanted. He himself was sorry that his mute, dead dust would lie upon these songs, perhaps very soon now. But if he had tried to teach one of them anything, it would surely have reminded him of of his Yegorushka, and then who knows what might have happened, because it, because it was only his perpetual silence that kept anyone from seeing him cry. Hmm. <laughs> Hey, James Lippincott, you're very welcome. And I'm glad that I've introduced you to the world of reading. That's one of my goals here at Book Club, to make it easily accessible. And so I'm very happy and thanks for sharing that with me. Behind each word of his, of his lay a sob, and he always had to shut his mouth very quickly and carefully to keep it from escaping at the same time. From early on, old Timofey had taught his only son, Yegor, a few songs, and when a boy of fifteen, he was already to a able to sing more songs more correctly than any of the fully grown lads in the village or in its vicinity. All the same, the old man used to say to the lad, generally on holidays, when he was slightly drunk, Yegorushka, my little dove, I've already taught you to sing many songs, many billiny, and also the legends of the saints, one for nearly every day. But, as you know, I'm the most knowledgeable in the whole gubernina, gubernia, and my father knew every song in Russia, so to speak, and Tartar stories besides. You're still very young, and so I have not yet told you the best billiny, in which the words are like icons and can't be compared with everyday words, and you have not yet learned how to sing those melodies which no one yet, be he a Cossack or a peasant, has ever been able to hear without weeping. Timofey would repeat this to his son on every Sunday, and all the many feast days in the Russian calendar, that is, fairly often, until, after a violent scene with the old man, the boy had vanished together with the beautiful Ustyonka, the daughter of a poor peasant. In the third year after that incident, Timofey fell ill, just at the time when one of those numerous bands of pilgrims, which constantly converge on Kiev from all sections of the extensive empire, was about to set out. Then the sick man's neighbour, Osip, came to see him. I'm leaving with the pilgrims, Timofey Ivan Ivanich, or Ivanich. Permit me to embrace you once again. 
Ossip wasn't friendly with the old man, but now that he was undertaking that distant journey, he felt it needful to take leave of him, as if of a father. I've hurt your feelings at times, he sobbed. Forgive me, dear heart. It happened while I was drunk, and no one can help that, as you know. Now I'll pray for you and light a candle for you. Farewell, Timothy Ivanovich. Ivanich. Little father, perhaps you'll get well again if God wishes. Then you'll sing to us again. Yes, yes, it's been a long time since you've sung. What songs those were? The one about Diok Step. Stepanovich, for instance. Do you think I've forgotten it? How foolish you are! I still know it all by heart. Of course not like you. You really and truly know it. I've got to say, God gave you that. To another man he gives other gifts. To me, for example. <clears throat> the old man who was lying on the heated platform turned round with a groan and made a gesture as if he wanted to say something. It was as if the name of Yegor could be faintly heard. Perhaps he wanted to send him some news. But when his neighbour, already at the door, asked, Did you say something, Timothy Ivan Ivanich? He was already lying there, perfectly still and merely shaking his white head gently. Nevertheless, God knows how it happened. Scarcely a year after Ossip's departure, Yegor returned quite unexpectedly. The old man didn't recognise him immediately, because it was dark in the hut and his aged eyes didn't easily accept a strange new figure. But after Timofey heard the stranger's voice, he became alarmed and leaped off the heated platform onto his shaky old legs. Yegor caught him and they hugged each other. Timofey was weeping. The young man kept on asking, "'Have you been sick long, father?' After the old man calmed down a bit, he crept back onto his heated platform and inquired, in a different, severe tone, And your wife? A pause. Yegor spat out the words, I've chased her away, you know, along with the child. He was silent for a while. Ossip came to see me once. Ossip Nikiforovovich, I said. Yes, he answered. It's me. Your father is sick, Yegor. He can't sing any more. It's completely quiet in the village now as if no one had no more soul, our village. No one knocks, no one budges, no one cries any more, and there's no real reason for laughing either. I thought about it. What was to be done? So I called over my wife. Ustyonka, I said. I must go home. No one else sings there any more. It's up to me. My father is sick. All right, said Ustyonka. But I can't take you along, I explained to her. As you know, my father doesn't want you, and I probably won't come back to you either once I'm back there singing. Ustyonka understood me. Well then, God go with you. There are many pilgrims here now, so people give lots of alms. God will help me, Yegor. And so I left, and now, father, tell me all your songs. <coughs> Word got around that Yegor had returned and that old Timofey was singing again. But that autumn the wind blew so violently through the village that no passer-by could ascertain with any assurance whether there was really singing in Timothy's house or not. And the door wasn't open to anyone who knocked. The two men wanted to be alone. Yegor sat on the edge of the heated platform on which his father lay and at times brought his ear right up to the old man's lips, for he was indeed singing. His old voice, somewhat stooped and trembling, carried all the best songs over to Yegor, who often waved his head or moved his dangling feet, exactly as if he were already singing them himself. Things went on that way for many days. Timofey kept finding some even lovelier song in his memory, often he'd awaken his son at night and, while making indistinct jet je <coughs> and while making indistinct gestures with his withered, twitching hands, he'd sing a short song and then another and yet another, until the lazy morning began to stir, soon after the most beautiful one had died. In the last days he had frequently lamented that he had still had a vast number of songs inside him, and had no more time to impart them to his son. He lay there with furrowed brow in strained, strained anxious thought, and his lips trembled with expectancy. From time to time he sat up, waved his head to and fro for a while, and moved his lips, and finally some quiet song was added to the sum. 
but now he generally kept repeating the same stanzas about Diuk Stepanovich that were his special favourites, and his son had to act amazed as if they were as if he were hearing them for the first time to avoid getting him angry. After old Timothy Ivanich died, the house in which Yegor now lived alone still remained locked for a time. Then, in early spring, Yegor Timofeyevich, who now had a fairly long beard, stepped out of his door and began to wander through the village singing. Afterward, he visit, visited the neighbouring villages too, and the peasants were already telling one another that Yegor had become a singer at least as knowledgeable as his father Timofey, for he knew a large number of religious and heroic songs, and all those melodies which no one, be he a Cossack or a peasant, could hear without weeping. In addition, he was said to have a soft, sad tone that no other singer had yet possessed, and this tone was always to be heard quite unexpectedly in the refrains, which made him particularly effective emotionally. At least, that's what I heard tell. Hey, Christina Cable, welcome. Hi there, nice to see you. So he didn't learn that one from his father, my friend Ewald asked after a while. No, I replied. No one knows where he got it from. After I had already stepped away from the window, the paralysed man made another gesture and called after me. Perhaps he was thinking about his wife and child. Besides, did he never send for them, seeing that his father was now dead? No, I don't think so. At any rate, when he died afterward, he was alone. The End Yes quite an interesting and different story there there's um a few different aspects that i picked up on there's the um the prodigal son the biblical story you know where the son goes off with the father's wealth and spends it all and the father mourns so there's an element of that that the old man was mourning for his son to come back and also it's quite educational about literature in in my studies of the uh, the religious and um epic poetry if you like two of which being the mahabharata and um homer's iliad and odyssey, odyssey uh supposedly they were already very old by the time they were written down so by the time they were first written down and these texts they've come down to us over i don't know 2 3 4000 years they were already very old before they were written down. So they would have, who knows how many generations they would have gone back. But this story illustrates how they would have been um, transferred from generation to generation. Timothy's dad, or Timothy Ivanich, or whatever his name is, um, he he's, he's a bard, I think, would be the, the term, the name. And he knows all the songs, and then he transfers them to his son who in turn, you know, sings and shares them with others. And then at some point in history, someone would have started writing these things down. And that's how, that's how we have all these great epics. That's how we have the, the Bhagavad Gita, all of Plato's works, um, the Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Euripides and all these other amazing classics because someone wrote them down, thankfully. Otherwise, you know, who who would have who would have known them if yeah maybe there'd be some tradition somewhere that is um you know sharing them and perhaps youtube's the new medium right um the new generation of uh, people sharing stories because in a way in the old days in in this story uh how timofey died with a song you would need to be in the let's say timofey went out and he was singing if you if you weren't there in the congregation in the communion listening to him singing the song then you would miss it and you'd only hear about it second hand from someone else oh timothy sang about this or he sang that famous song and it was beautiful and everyone was crying and all this but here it doesn't matter if you're not here live because you're watching it now it doesn't matter and that's the power of youtube and technology so maybe this is the second um Second coming, a new age of sort of, um, yeah, telling stories. That's what I'm doing, isn't it? The world's greatest stories, that is. So, yeah, who knows? And, and I'm really, yeah, 
um, motivated to just keep sharing stories. And like I say, this one's only a short one, so it's uh, no issue for me to do it this evening. Uh, Audrey has wonderfully supported me once again, so thank you very much, Audrey. And James Lippincott shared a beautiful comment, so thank you, my friend. As always, it's nice to see Christina, and that was a very good story. It gives us a little bit of an insight into the times before books and writing, because books were only created in the 16th century, right? Gutenberg's Press. Before that, there was no books. Imagine if you lived in the 1500s, you lived in 1510. There's no books, no books. The church had the Bible, and they would tell you what it said. No one was reading the Bible. No one's reading anything because there's no books. <laughs> so it's crazy to think of the history of books. I often think about doing a video, but yeah, it'd be very uh, difficult, I think, to, to do. But who knows? If you're interested in that, let me know in the comments. But that's all for now. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm very excited for tomorrow's read. It's going to be Seneca's On the Shortness of Life. So I think if we all can get through that and take away the lessons we'll realise, I think his famous quote is, it's not that man doesn't have enough time, it's that he wastes a lot of it. Or that's paraphrasing, it's at the end, it's the last quote at the end. And I think that's true. If we didn't waste any time, I think we could achieve all of our goals. But procrastination's real, isn't it, guys? It's not so easy. But I'm rambling on, so I'm going to say bye. Otherwise, I'll just sit here all night chatting away to no one. But anyway, thanks everyone for joining me. Try and make tomorrow because I think it's going to be uh, pretty profound. So I've never, I've read it a few times, but not for many years. So I'm excited to revisit it. And I hope you'll be able to join me and we can take away the wisdom and lessons within it and incorporate them into our own lives. So guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Look after yourselves. Take care. And I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. See you.